Well, hey everybody, and welcome to the online worship service. At St. Paul's, we are a people together who believe that God's word is at the center and Jesus Christ is Lord. And we're really thankful that you're joining us today as we continue to celebrate this Advent season. We're looking forward to Christmas. We're looking forward to celebrating the coming of Jesus to the earth. God becoming flesh and bringing the kingdom of heaven to us. And so we're just grateful and excited to celebrate this Advent season. We got our festivities up. We've been singing uh, oldie but goodie Christmas worship songs. And so we are just excited about this time of year. And I'm sure you and your family are too. And so uh, in the spirit of that, we are just uh, wanting to encourage you to devote yourself to remembering Jesus' coming for us. The high schoolers have written uh, Advent devotionals for us, and so we want to encourage you to grab one of those. If you need one, please call the church office or come by and pick one up here at the church building. We'd love to get you one of those. And just, just be reading the scriptures. Just be praying and asking God to help you remember all that Jesus has done because we get to celebrate him. As they say, he's the reason for this season. And so with that, I'd like to encourage us, let's pray together and ask God to bless this time of worship and this month of preparing to celebrate his coming. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for Christmas and all that it is. God, that, that baby born in a feeding trough is God most high, the king of all. And he came to bring us into fellowship with you. He came to stand up for us. He came to purify us. And we get to see that today. Jesus came to set us free from sin. Take it away. We thank you, Lord God. And we pray that as we celebrate this Christmas season with our families and our own time as a church body, we would be looking up to Jesus, seeing that he came and seeing that he's coming again for all who wait on him. We thank you, Lord, and we wait on you. And God, we pray that you bless this time of worship together. And now, Father, we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bible, and we would ask you that you please go ahead and open it up. You can pause the video if you need to get it or find the passage. But the first scripture reading today is found in the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 9, verses 24 through 28. That's in Hebrews 9, starting with verse 24. And the author tells us, For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor was it that he would offer himself often as the high priest enters the holy place year by year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once, at the consummation of the ages, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And inasmuch as is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment. So Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. The second scripture reading is found in the Gospel of John, the very beginning of it. John chapter 1, verses 29 through 34. John's Gospel 1, starting with verse 29. John writes for us, The next day John the Baptist saw Jesus coming to him 
and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he on behalf of whom I said, After me comes a man who is a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. I did not recognize him, but so that he might be manifested to Israel. I came baptizing in water. John testified, saying, I have seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained upon him. I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said, said to me, He upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. May God bless the reading of his word and may God bless us as we continue worshiping him together. Welcome to our time in the Word of God. I'm so thankful that we have this great opportunity, this season of Advent, to acknowledge the coming of Jesus. And as we go through each of these weeks of Advent, we are wanting to invite you to ask with us, why did Jesus come? And today we are looking at our second 
passage in the letter uh, of John entitled 1 John, uh, right? He wrote the Gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then toward the latter part of the New Testament, he wrote three smaller letters, 1 and 2 and 3 John. And this morning, we're going to be together in 1 John chapter 3. And as we turn to 1 John chapter 3 together, would you bow your heads with me in prayer? Father God, we're asking that you would open up uh, our eyes and, and our ears. Lord God, let us understand with the help of your Holy Spirit what you're teaching us today through your word. And then we're asking, Holy Spirit, that you would help us, strengthen us, renew us to obey your word. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, many of you will remember last week, Scott Jenkins held a large shovel, and, and he used that shovel as an illustration to demonstrate how Satan oftentimes will go through our lives, and sometimes all the way to the past, and he'll try to scoop up things from our past and put it on top of us. Satan is an accuser, and Jesus, we learned last week, is our advocate, but Satan will accuse us of sin, and his desire is that we would stay in that sin, underneath the weight of that sin and the shame of that sin. And today we're going to look and find in the Word of God one of the very reasons why Jesus came is to save us from our sin. In fact, the title of the sermon today is Jesus Came to Take Away Sin. And the main point for us to think about is that Jesus came to purify you. He came to purify you. To cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And as we go through the word of God, I want to put in front of you that, and that picture again of that shovel that Scott Jenkins held. And realize that Jesus is not the one holding that shovel. But rather, he is the one that held on to the nails. That put him on the cross. Jesus came to take away your sin and to purify you, to present you to the Father as a redeemed child belonging to God. And so, we Christians, we take Jesus in to our hearts. And, and he comes in and he came to take away the sin of your heart. And when we receive Jesus, then we can allow sin to go. And the commandments of God that are clearly throughout the scriptures, the commandments come to us almost with a refreshing breath of God by the work of the Holy Spirit who helps us to love the word of God and to love the commands of God. And the Spirit of God helps us to obey them. And this is the idea, again, that Jesus, as he came to take away sin, what is included in that taking away of the sin of our lives is Jesus, as he takes away the sin, he also takes away guilt. He takes away shame. He takes away all condemnation. And as he does that, Jesus brings healing to our hearts healing to our minds, healing to our soul and spirit. He brings deliverance from all that is evil. Jesus came to take away sin. And so with that in mind, turn with me to 1 John chapter 3. Let's look at beginning with verse 1. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us, Christians, is that it did not know Him, Jesus. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when He, Jesus, appears, we shall be like Him, because we shall see Him as He is. 
and everyone who thus hopes in him, in Jesus, purifies himself as he, Jesus, is pure. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness, for sin is lawlessness. You know that he, Jesus, appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him, in Jesus, keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as he, Jesus, is righteous. Here ends the reading of God's word. We're going to study this passage, but would you pray with me now? Lord Jesus, would you help us? Holy Spirit, strengthen us. Help us to obey these words and to put them into practice for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you look back with me as we look at the very first point today, the first of two? Point number one is that ignoring God's law is sin. Verse four, reading from the Amplified Version, everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness. Ignoring God's law by action or neglect or by tolerating wrongdoing, being unrestrained by his commands and his will. Lawlessness is living without the law, living away from God, living without God's word and spirit. That's lawlessness. And we know lawlessness. We have known disobedience, you and I. We've known what it is to disobey God. David Butts, a beautiful man of God, wrote this, Holiness, it is a subject that seems to have been lost in the shuffle at the end of the second millennium. It has been forgotten in light of the fact that most of us aren't living holy lives and have therefore very little to say about holiness. You and I should have a lot to say about holiness, for the God that we serve and worship is holy, and he says to us, be holy as I am holy. And the place that Jesus went to prepare a place for us so that we could be with him there, in that place the angels sing all day long, holy, 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 holy. Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy. You and I need to learn about the holiness of God. And we need to love God in His holiness. But holiness is the opposite of sinfulness. Holiness is the opposite of sinfulness. And you and I in this dark, sinful world, we know way too much about sinfulness and ignoring God's law is sin. Being unaware of God's law would lead us to a lifestyle of sin, unrestrained. In college, I was driving with a friend and I told her, hey, you know, just so you know, the, the red stop signs that have white around the edge, those are optional. And unbeknownst to me, this friend was very gullible and she drove right through the stop sign. We were in a small little town, kind of like Gifford, ignoring or being unaware or being misinformed about the law of God. Ignoring God's law is sin. And so again, as we are asking the question this Advent season, why did Jesus have to come? Why did he have to take away our sin? Why can't we just take care of it ourselves? It's because our sin leads us on a tangent away from the word and the will and the ways of God. Sin takes us away. And when we're there, Satan loves 
to grab a foothold and a, put a stronghold on us to keep us in that sin away from God. Satan loves to put our sin on top of us and to make it a weight upon us. Romans 3 verse 11 says that there's no one righteous, not even one. Romans 3.23 says that all have sinned, all have fallen short of the glory of God. And Romans 6.23 says that the wages of sin is death. You and I cannot save ourselves from our sins. You and I cannot on our own stop sinning. I was watching the movie Frozen with my grandson this week, and it's amazing sometimes when you pay attention to the messages of this world, how close they are to the messages of the Word of God. And yet they leave us wanting, as Christians, the messages of the world leave us wanting. But a quote from the movie Frozen, the heart is not easily changed, but the head can be persuaded. The heart cannot be easily changed, but the head can be persuaded. And so we can have a mental knowledge of the things of God. We can know about Jesus, and then in our hearts we can have unforgiveness, which can grow into bitterness. And then what we see manifested in our relationships, when unforgiveness is in the heart, what grows in the mind and in the whole body is bitterness. And then strife can begin to be the most amazing thing going from one person to the other. We cannot ignore the commands of God as Christians. As we follow Jesus, the commands of God are to be known and rehearsed. And with the help of the Spirit of God, followed. We cannot ignore our teacher Jesus. We cannot allow sin to remain. For we read very simply in chapter 3 of 1 John, verse 6. No one who abides in Jesus keeps on sinning. And no one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. And so you and I, we cannot be stuck in our sins following Jesus. Because he came to take our sins away. And that's exactly what he does. God wants us for himself. And so that sinfully separating lifestyle needs the Savior. And that's why Jesus came. If you look with me in the Gospel of Matthew, the very first book in the New Testament, chapter 1, we see in chapter 1, beginning at verse 18, Joseph was to be married to Mary. He was betrothed to her. And an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph. And look with me in verse 20, what that angel said. Right in the middle of Joseph in a dream, the angel said, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, even though she is with child. For that which is in her is conceived by the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. Jesus means the Lord saves and Jesus came to take away our sins. Did you read that? That Jesus came to take away our sins. I'm so thankful that that's why Jesus came. As we continue, we, we want to acknowledge that while ignoring God's law is sin. We want to look at the second point now. Knowing Jesus produces hope. Knowing Jesus produces hope. 
And, and even though you and I have had sin at times lurking beneath the surface, and it, it, it at times has grown into something that others could see, a, a behavior pattern, maybe a language, uh, a, a swearing habit, maybe a, a materialistic lifestyle where you needed more and more. People have seen that idolatry with that sin in your heart of loving things more than you've loved God. Ignoring God's law is sin, but knowing Jesus produces hope. And let's look at why that is. Look with me at Verse 2, beloved, this is in 1 John 3, verse 2. We are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. And that gives us hope that we are God's children even though we don't look like what we will look like in heaven. God is able to renew our hearts and Jesus came to take away the sin. And as the sin is forgiven... You and I have fresh hope of eternal life because we know beyond a shadow of a doubt. Look at verse 1, what it says. See, behold, look at what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God. And that is what you and I are. Knowing Jesus produces hope. Jesus is not the Grinch who's trying to take away your fun. No, as you receive the commandments of God, Jesus comes to you on the cross, paying for that sin that you and I have committed, and he takes that sin away. He takes that guilt away. He takes that addiction away. The chains are broken through the blood of Jesus. Jesus is not just a seasonal religious figure like Santa Claus who comes around once a year with empty gifts. No, Jesus came with himself, with the life of God within him. And he gave it up. And his gift has a lasting result where even though sin will come into your heart, Jesus teaches us you can confess that sin and you will be forgiven. Look at 1 John 1, 9. It says, if we confess our sin, you and I have strayed away from God at times. If we confess that we have sinned, God who is faithful and just will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness and we're cleansed by the blood of Jesus shed on the cross. Last week, Scott Jenkins asked, have you asked Jesus to be your advocate or your public defender? Is Jesus the one who stands in between you and everyone else? When, when you look at other people, do you look at them through the lens of the cross and let Jesus be your advocate, your defender today? I would ask you this. Are you willing to allow Jesus to be your strong tower that you run into him and find safety? Proverbs 18.10 says that the name of the Lord is a strong tower and that those who run into him are Safe, And we looked at 1 John chapter 3. And we read that no one in verse 6, no one who abides in Jesus keeps on sinning. Why? Because of verse 5 at the end. You know that Jesus appeared in order to take away sins. And in Jesus there is no sin. And yet you and I, as sinful individuals, are allowed to run into Jesus and we're safe. Because he takes away our sin. 
You come to Jesus with your sin and he takes you in and he takes your sin away. For he already paid for it on the cross. In verses 5 and 6, finally, as we're looking at knowing Jesus produces hope, we need to know that Jesus appeared. He came to take away our sin. And yet, verse 6, it, it, it adds this interesting statement. No one who lives in Jesus, who has come into him, keeps on sinning. And that leads me to ask you another question. How are you doing at keeping, holding on to, memorizing, holding on to the commandments of God? How are you doing with that? And what is the litmus test? How can you determine? How am I doing? The simple answer is by faith. When you and I find ourselves over here, by faith, even though we have strayed from God, we've wandered onto our own path, we've left the way of God, we've taken our eyes off Jesus, and we've wandered away, by faith, and obedience with the help of the Holy Spirit. We confess our sin as we run into Jesus by faith. By faith and by hope. We know Jesus. And with that hope in our hearts, we continue to return to him, even confessing our sins. We do this because of what we read in Hebrews Chapter 9, verse 26. Hebrews 9, verse 26, we read these words. For Jesus would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, Jesus appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Jesus put away sin. Jesus came to take away or to put away sin. Jesus came to purify you, to make you holy, undefiled, and guiltless. That is why Jesus came. And I would invite you, to look one more time at 1 John 3, verse 3. Everyone who thus hopes in him, in Jesus alone, purifies himself as he is pure. Today I want to invite you to put your hope in Jesus and allow him to take away your sin. Allow him to forgive you and to cleanse you and receive the hope of God, the peace of God that is in Christ Jesus. Would you pray with me? Oh, Father, we come to you right now, Jesus. We receive your cleansing and forgiveness. We release to you all of our sin, and we thank you for taking it away as far as the east is from the west. So far, remove it from us, we pray now. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's continue to worship the Lord together. This is my desire to Is in you. 
I want to invite you at this time to understand the cross is before us. And we have come to Jesus. And we come to his table today together. And I want to invite you right now to uh, get the elements, the bread and the wine or the grape juice that you're going to be receiving. For we have the opportunity to receive from the Lord at his table at this time. And uh, once you have the bread, would you take it with me and would you hold it? And let's acknowledge that Jesus' body was broken for us. And he was willing to allow his body to be broken and his blood to be shed so that he could take away our sin. And from our hearts, let's admit, let's acknowledge, let's confess our sin to God. And I'd invite you just to take a moment now and to personally confess your sin to God. And to let, and let him take it from you. Let him forgive you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And now let's remember what took place in that upper room. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so let's acknowledge and receive together the body of Christ broken for us. Let's take and eat together. And then I would invite you to take your grape juice or wine, as it were. For after the supper, Christ took the cup and saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of their sins. Do this in remembrance of me. And so let's acknowledge the shed blood of Jesus and let's take and drink together. And as the blood-bought children of God, let's pray the prayer that Jesus has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Today and every single day as you wake up, as the mercy of God is new each and every morning, would you remember that Jesus came to take away your sin. He came to make you pure and undefiled, holy in the presence of God. He came to deliver you from evil. And so continue to return to Jesus and receive that renewal and cleansing. And may God bless you and may he keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. Have a wonderful week. And I look forward to seeing you soon.